Hey Pete. Alright folks, sorry it's been a, a bit of a delayed start there with a few technical issues, uh, as often is the case when it comes to technology, but we're, we're here, we're live, I'm here with my good friend Paul, uh, fellow pastor at City in the Hill, uh, and Pete, Pete Anderson, so welcome if you're, if you're joining us. Uh, if, if, if you've never been part of City in the Hill event before, it's great to have you connecting. And uh, tonight we're just doing a special uh, one-off evening, evening kind of short reflective time together at the end of a really, really important, important week. Uh, but before we get going, Paul, how's your day been? What have you been up to today? Um, it's been a good day. Um, church online this morning. Um, very good preacher. Uh, very good word. Um, really good just to get into those um, parts of the Bible looking at Jesus and teasing out his heart and what he does. Our intercessor. Superb. And then this afternoon with my family we went up into town and we were part of the huge crowd as we stood and paid our tribute to Queen Elizabeth II and Sir Cortez went past. It was a very poignant moment and people in the crowd visibly moved. Yeah. A lot of emotion. Yeah. Yeah. Because you know if you folks uh, tuning in it'd be I don't know how many, I'm sure many of you were, were also part of that crowd in Edinburgh uh, watching um, the, the, the procession as it, as it came through the city. So maybe post your own reflections and feelings uh, in the chat. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of these once in a lifetime moments where we can pay respects. Yeah, so my, my day, I was a, uh, what was I doing? Yeah, I, 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 I was in our south service, we had a south service, so unfortunately I wasn't able to be in the city centre for... Uh, for the procession, but yeah, and it was a really special time over near Pennycook at our South Gallery, so great. Hey folks from South, if any of you are joining today, it's great to be with you. Uh, but yeah, so we're gonna have a, we're gonna have, tonight our plan is, we're going to have a time of reflecting and um, just, it's been an important weekend, but before we get into that, let me just tell you about City in the Hill. City in the Hill, we have a vision where our, our passion can be summed up in two Bible verses. Jesus told us to go make disciples, and that's what we want to do. And he also told us to love God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. And our passion is to do that. And he also told us to love our neighbour as we love ourselves. So I guess in summary you could say, love God, love others, make disciples. That's what City and the Hill yeah. are all about. And, uh, and we've had a pretty important week just past. Uh, we've had a week of prayer and fasting uh, as a church. And uh, it's been really significant. I believe that Truly, we take ground on our knees and a uh, week of prayer and fasting, I think, is a trigger moment where we see God do something in our church and yeah. in our city and in our region, God willing, in our nation as a result of our praying. So thanks to everyone who's participated in that yeah. week of prayer and fasting. Yeah. 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 Um, so the plan for tonight um, is that we take time to reflect on the events of the last few days. And we just slow down a bit and reflect. And we're going to turn to the Bible, God's Word, and we're going to hear from God's Word and what God has to say to us. And then we're going to finish with some time of prayer. So, reflection, Scripture, and God's Word. Do you want to start us by praying? Yeah. Let's pray wherever you are. If you want to join with me, just um, join with me in this moment. We come to you, Almighty God, King of Kings, the great constant one, the unchanging one, the Alpha and the Omega. And we come to you and we come into your presence in and through Jesus, our intercessor. We ask that your Holy Spirit will fill this moment, touch our hearts, remind us of the truths of your words, inspire us with the example of Queen Elizabeth II, but most of all, lift our eyes to Jesus. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let me just give you some, some context for our evening gathering tonight. We weren't able to have a city centre big gathering today like we usually would because uh, the venue we use, Charlotte Chapel, was literally in the middle of all the crowds of people. So, and it, so it wouldn't have been appropriate for us to have a service today, but we thought we'd have this additional service tonight because this week has been like no other week. Uh, the, 
our, our dear Queen, Queen Elizabeth II, uh, aged 96, passed away this week after 70 years reigning. In fact, the longest reigning British monarch. Um, incredible, incredible mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. And we're going to take a bit of time tonight to recognise her life and give pay tribute to her. It's also been an important week in that we've we've appointed a new king over the United Kingdom, uh, King Charles and Camilla as his uh, Queen Consort. And also we have a new Prime Minister, Liz Truss. And so, <clears throat> so much has happened in one week yeah. for this nation. Yeah. And uh, this is what the Bible says. It, it, it says, 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 17, Honour all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honour the King. Mm. So tonight, just, just to be really clear on this, tonight this isn't to do with whether you are agreeing with the monarchy or not. It's nothing to do with that. Yeah. We're, we're just as Christians, we, we have a conviction that God loves all people and we are to pay due honour and respect to people in the dignity, in places of positions of uh, power. And so we are to honour all people. And again, whether, whether you agree with the monarchy or not, we love the Queen and we honour the Queen and we honour the new King. And uh, we, we want to take time to recognise that and pray. Love the brotherhood, fear God and honour the King. Now, Peter, the Apostle, wrote that when the ruler of Rome was called Nero. I mean, <laughs> there wouldn't be much you could agree with, yeah. with Nero. He was a brutal man. And yet Peter even then said, honour the King or another translation is honour the Emperor. Yeah, so... That's our heart tonight, and that's the context that we find ourselves in. So Paul, tell us something about Queen Elizabeth. Yeah, um, just, just a few moments to, to share with you my own personal tribute, and those of you um, on Facebook Live, just you know, post your own reflections and your own um, important parts of your tribute to her. Um, I, I've simply put her around the letter C each time, so um, so bear with me, you'll at least be able to remember these as you take them away. I think of Queen Elizabeth II, I think of her confession, a personal, real confession of faith in God, a personal, strong faith in the Word of God she constantly referred to, and at times even in her speeches, um, she would have a copy of the Bible with her. And you might say that was easy back in the day in 1952, but I think even in her latter years in a very multicultural, diverse um, situation like the United Kingdom, her faith seemed to even come more to the front. She was not embarrassed. She was not afraid to say that she owned Jesus Christ as Lord. She believed in him, but also she lived it. It wasn't just a confession. She lived it out. People... The, the tributes have been pouring in. People watched and they saw something in her and that something had its roots in her faith in the Word of God. Um, her Christmas broadcasts um, were something really significant for the nation. And in 1952, her very first Christmas um, broadcast, she said this, Pray for me that God may give me wisdom and strength to carry out the solemn promises I shall be making and that I may faithfully serve him and you all the days of my life. I, I love that boldness of a confession of faith in God as the very, very, very young queen to the whole nation and commonwealth. I believe in God and I'm going to serve him. And then if you jump forward in, Christ, in her Christmas speech in 2000, she said this, For me, the teachings of Christ and my own personal accountability before God, that provides a framework in which I try to lead, lead my life. Consistency right through of this confession of faith, believing in God, but also living it out in a remarkable way. So I also think of another C, um, constancy. Um, I think I was five years old when I first saw the Queen drive past the town that I lived in in Northern Ireland. 
and I knew there was something significant. I didn't grasp um, the real depth of it at that point. But here we are all those years later and she has just been a constant presence in the nation and in the Commonwealth. When we got to 25 years, we went, wow, 25 years as a queen, that's something. Then we got to 50 and went, wow, that's really remarkable. And then we got to 75, my goodness, constant, constant, constant. Under her um, reign as queen, 15 different prime ministers from Churchill right through to Liz Truss today. But she led as a leader, no scandal, no skeletons in the cupboard, nothing to hide, nothing to be embarrassed about. Such a constant and consistent leader. Mark Green, himself a leader, um, drew inspiration from her and he said this, the first time I ever thought seriously about the Queen was when God told me to. It was 2015. Elizabeth was 89. I had asked God a specific question. Please show me someone in the public eye who is an outstanding whole life disciple of Jesus. Someone whose faith shapes all they do and say. Elizabeth was God's answer. Swift, clear, witty and to be shared. And since that day, Mark says, it's become ever clearer to me that Elizabeth was a gift from God to the nation, to the Commonwealth, and indeed the global community. A beacon of humility, of grace, astuteness, good humour, generosity, and of deep faith. I love what he says. God's woman, God's follower, God's queen. What a tribute to Queen Elizabeth II. Another C I was going to talk about was corgis, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> you can have, you can post your own comments on the corgis. <laughs> Let me talk about something more serious. Compassion. My tribute to Queen Elizabeth II. Her compassion. I, I watched mostly from a distance and, and watched the way she interacted in such a human, kind, humble way incredible compassion she didn't remain on her throne in distance she came amongst people she was known as a person who was gracious who was kind we, we, we sang in the national anthem god save our gracious queen and she was a gracious queen and that grace came from her faith in jesus personally one of the things that really touched me most was her forgiveness. And if you remember, um, often, in, I, came, I come from Northern Ireland, and many of her, the Queen's soldiers were brutally killed. And the Queen had the opportunity to meet some of the perpetrators of those crimes. And she forgave, she held out her hand, she smiled, and she engaged with them. Such a woman of compassion. And I think of Christmas um, from 1952 right through, just every Christmas sharing the gospel, sharing Christ, sharing her faith. Moments that kind of brought the nation together. Most of us will remember her Christmas broadcast um, during the pandemic and she just spoke with such love and kindness but also gave us direction and spoke of hope. What a wonderful example. And lastly, I think of her courage. Goodness, when you reach that age, you have lived through much in your life. The courage that she showed in her family life. Her family life was not easy. You might think, oh, it's the Queen. It's... No, it's not easy. She has lived through division and divorce and scandals and always had the courage to keep going. The courage that she has shown in the face of pain, in the face of loss, and in the face of division in her family, but also in the nation. 
and perhaps most significantly, the courage that she showed in the face of death. The Archbishop of Canterbury had the absolute honour of interviewing the Queen just in June recently. And he said of that moment with her, the Queen had no fear of death and she drew strength from the rock on which she stood. No fear in death. She knew the rock upon which she stood. What wonderful courage. People in the media, um, Pete, have been saying over the last days, what an inspirational leader, she's great at that, I can see this. But very few of the media have been asking, where does that come from? Yeah, that's very true. And she was this woman mm -hmm. because she had a faith in Christ. Yeah. That's the source, that's the, the root of her leadership. Yeah. That's where it came from. It's mm. not just something in her DNA. It's not that. Mm. It's a faith in Christ. Mm. And she lived that out. Her faith in King Jesus, her personal relationship with mm. King Jesus, made her the leader that she was. Brilliant, Paul. Yeah, and uh, Paul, that's a great overview of her faith. Let me, let me just take some moments just now to take us to Scripture. Mm. And what does the Bible say about a moment like this and I'm going to take you to uh, an incredible vision in the Bible that a prophet had of Jesus. People having visions of Jesus isn't very common. I mean the reality is Queen Elizabeth now sees Jesus. She's in the very presence of the King of Kings and some people are privileged in this life to actually have a vision of Jesus. My mum in the in the last few days before she passed away in 1996, she had a vision of Jesus. It was so vivid for her. She was exuberant. She could hardly express in words. And she, she, it's like for the last couple of days of her life, she was so full of joy because she'd seen Jesus. It was so tangible. I remember one of our churches in northern Nigeria, uh, they had a, a precious Muslim man called Ida Iza. He had three dreams in three consecutive nights in which, where he saw a vision of Jesus. And on the back of those dreams, he knew he needed to become a follower of Jesus. He went and found our friend Amin, who leads the church in northern yeah. Nigeria. And he said, I've seen Jesus in a vision. I want to become his follower. And Amin knew, I mean, it's, it, that is not safe. In northern Nigeria, that's not a safe choice to make. So Amin said, are you sure you want to do this? And Ida is a said, of course. And he was willing to give his life to follow Jesus. And it, it meant literally he had to relocate from his home because his relatives would have killed him. They were from a Muslim background, very hardline Muslim background. So for him, it would have meant he would be potentially killed if he stayed where he was. He needed to relocate to another town. And then he trained to become a pastor, to put himself on the very front line and put his life at risk. Why would someone risk so much? Because he had a vision of Jesus. And just like Paul's describing the Queen, behind the scenes, behind her public activities, she had this faith in Jesus. So let me take you to this famous vision that Isaiah had of Jesus. This is Isaiah chapter 6 and, and verse 1. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Here uh, a monarch, a king, had died. But on the year that the king died, Isaiah saw the king of kings. King Uzziah has died, but God's alive. There's not a single head of state that will be here 70 years from now. The turnover of world leadership is 100%. 110 years from now, the earth will be populated by billions of new people. We will all have vanished. But not God. He had no beginning. He depends on nothing for his existence. He always has been and always will be alive. God is authoritative. He's seated on a throne. There's no vision of heaven that ever saw God plowing a field, cutting grass, Shining shoes, filling out reports, or loading a truck. 
the throne is his right to rule the world. Yeah. Yeah. And Isaiah, in the year that King Uzziah died, saw the Lord seated on the throne. Let's continue in the verse of verse 2. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two wings they covered their feet, and with two wings they were flying. They were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. <laughs> you imagine this, this scene that Isaiah see. He's seen these awesome beings, seraphim, angels, angelic beings. And the reality is, any time a human being sees an angel, and I know some of you have, People are blown away by the brilliance and power of angelic beings. And yet these angelic beings that would blow us away are blown away with in holy fear and reverence for the splendor of God. Yeah. Isn't that incredible? Isaiah saw God. This was, this verses, these verses we're reading in Isaiah chapter 6 were written around about 740 years before Christ. 800 years after this, okay, so... 740 years after Jesus came, and then a few decades later, John the Apostle, 90 AD roughly, has a vision of Jesus. And this is recorded for us in the book of Revelation. And this is, this is what it describes. He sees this vision of heaven, just like Isaiah did 800 years before. And this is what John sees. It's recorded for us in Revelation chapter 8. Uh, and it says, verse 4. Day and night they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. Here we see the incredible reality that John saw the angels in heaven. And here they are 800 years later and they're still saying, Holy, holy, holy. And that's incredible. Heaven's still singing. They haven't missed a beat. 800 years has passed. And yet the angels are still worshipping. They're perpetually blown away by God. The novelty never wears off. Our friend uh, Derek Lamont, mm -hmm. who is the pastor of St Columbus Free Church in, in, on the Royal Mile in Edinburgh City Centre. Um, a couple of Christmases ago he lost his mum. And I remember him telling me that in the days before she died, she didn't have a vision of Jesus. But she started hearing singing. It was like she was getting a glimpse over into the next reality as a follower of Jesus you start hearing angelic songs I have to tell you whether it's 740 BC 90 AD or 2022 if you could peer into heaven right now the angels are blown away by the majesty and the greatness of God in this moment of mourning for the nation uh, in, the, in a year when our queen has died God is on the throne and God is glorious Isaiah's response to this vision, he says in verse 5, Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King of glory, the Lord Almighty. He is a massive dilemma. He's a sinner and he knows it. I mean, in the presence of the purity of God, he became aware of the filthiness of his own sin and every one of us would right we're all sinners mm. and he has a huge dilemma how can a sinner be in God's presence I mean if Adam was expelled from Eden how much more a sinner from the very presence of God in heaven and so he needed to cleanse and what happens next is in verse 6 and 7 it says one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hands which he had taken with thongs from the altar and he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. How can sin be cleansed? How can your sin be cleansed? How can my sin be cleansed? How was Queen Elizabeth's sin cleansed? Well, Isaiah went on to have several visions of Jesus. Here he's seen Jesus on the throne. But in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, he sees a virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And she'll give him the name Emmanuel. He sees, wow, this one I'm seeing on the throne is going to enter into human history. He's going to be born to a virgin. 
And then later on in Isaiah 53, verses 3 and 5, he's going to see the one who was born to the virgin, the one who's been on the throne, the one who's born to a virgin, and he's now going to see him on the cross. In a vision, he says, he was despised and rejected by mankind. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. Incredible. How can you be cleansed from your sin? Well, Isaiah realised the one on the throne came off the throne, entered into human existence, died on a cross, paid a price for our sin, and through Jesus we can be saved. And that's incredible. The Queen herself said in her Christmas address in 2011, Although we are capable of great acts of kindness, history teaches us that sometimes we need saving from ourselves. God sent into the world a unique person, neither a philosopher nor a general, but a saviour, with power to forgive. You folks, you know, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness. So God sent us a saviour. And then the passage concludes with this amazing commission. And this is the beginning of Isaiah's ministry as a prophet. It says this, Isaiah 6 verses 7 to 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. So look who volunteered. The one who had seen God's glory volunteered, and so would you. And the one who had been cleansed from his sin volunteered. You know what? Isaiah spent the next 60 years, this next six decades of his life, serving God. Because he was so grateful. God's amazing. I've been cleansed from my sin. Here am I, send me. And folks, that's appropriate, okay? That's completely appropriate. When you realise the greatness of God, when you realise how much he's forgiven your sin, it's completely, wholly appropriate for you to say, count me in God, here's my life, here's my 24-7, here's my time, my talents and my treasures, I want to serve you, I want to bring honour to God in my life. They say amen if you agree, I can't hear you but you're welcome to hit the love heart or type amen or something. But I believe that, it's completely appropriate. This is what Queen Elizabeth said, Age 21 years old, just before her coronation, this is 1947, she said this. I declare before you that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service, she said to the British public. God help me to make good on my vow. She was dedicated to a life of purpose. Isaiah was dedicated to a life of purpose. God is calling you and I. Maybe you won't be as famous as the Queen. Maybe you won't be as famous as Isaiah the prophet. But behind the scenes, or maybe a bit more public, whatever it's going to be, live a life of honour and glory to God. Say this with me. Here am I. Send me. I'm going to take a moment just to pray. Um, I'm going to lead us just in a short prayer as we give thanks for the Queen and then we're going to take a minute's silence for each of us to pray and reflect. Pray with me. We thank you Father God for all the memories, the thoughts, the images, the words that come to our lives concerning Queen Elizabeth II and it's almost like we hear over her life what Paul the Apostle had said follow me in so much as I follow Christ and we thank you that she points us to Jesus the King we thank you for her life we thank you for the privilege of ever having known her in whatever way we might understand that word. I pray that you will help us not to emulate her, but emulate the one that she followed, Jesus.
We thank you for it. We're going to take a minute of silence and just reflect. The great verse to now pray. Let's take a minute. It says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, Paul the Apostle said this, and the ones to hear this is really important. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings, and for those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Saviour who wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So what I want us to do is I want us to take a moment just to pray for some key people. So what I'll do is I'll lead us in this prayer and then after I want us to pray for Charles as he is now King Charles III. For his Queen Consort Camilla. I want us to pray for Liz Truss the new Prime Minister. And I want us to pray for Nicola Sturgeon, the, the Scottish First Minister. And again, this is nothing to do with, you know, this is nothing to do with whether you like the politics or any, this is to do with the Bible says we are to pray for those who are in authority and we are to show due honour and respect. So join me as we pray. I'll lead us off and then I'll give just a, a little bit of time for you to pray your own prayers. Okay, so let's pray together. Lord God, thank you so much for... Uh, the life of Queen Elizabeth, we're grateful for her legacy. But now, Lord God, we, as we now look forward into the future, we pray, Father, would you help King Charles, help him just as you helped his mother? Would you give him the same faith that his mother had? I don't know where he's at in the same way with you. And your word tells us that we're to pray for those in authority. And your, it goes on and says that you desire all men and women to come to know you. And our prayer, God, is that you would save Charles and you would save Camilla. Give them a vision of Jesus and also enable them to leave well in this nation. Lord God, we pray for Liz Truss as she now takes on um, the reins of the Conservative Party and the role of Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. We pray, Father, would you give her wisdom to lead well? Father, we pray under her reign. We ask you, we pray for the Church of Jesus Christ across these islands. Lord God, would you cause the Church to thrive during this period of history? We pray, God, Liz Trust will have wisdom in, uh, from God. And I pray she would have visions and dreams. Reveal yourself to Liz Trust. We pray for Nicola Sturgeon, Lord. I don't know where she's at with you. I pray you would reveal yourself to her. In your kindness and your deep love for her, would you soften her heart and bring it to Jesus? God, give her wisdom for Scotland. Give her wisdom to govern well here. Lord, I pray, give her wisdom for education, for welfare, for the poorest of the poor. God, give her wisdom, God, for how to run this country and to set laws in motion. We pray for these political leaders and for these monarchs. We ask for wisdom for them. We ask this in Jesus' name. All right, I'll give you space. You pray your own prayers just now, and in a minute, Paul will lead us in the next section of prayer. Let's pray. Amen. Amen. 
In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on his throne, says Isaiah. And in the year that our Queen has died, may we each see the Lord seated on his throne. Bring your life, bring your circumstances, bring your family, your workplace, your city, bring it all to God. For he is on the throne and nothing, nothing is impossible with him. I'm going to pray and then I'm going to give you space to pray as well in response. Lord God, open the eyes of our heart to see the King, King Jesus on the throne, rightfully his. He's comfortable, he's at ease, he is in control, he is large and he is in charge. And we bow before him and we surrender our lives and we trust you with all the details of our lives. We trust you with the good things. We trust you with the more difficult things. Your way is perfect. In Jesus' name, take time now just to pray your own response to the King who is on the throne. Thank you, God. Thank you, you're on the throne. And finally, folks, as we as we come into land now, um, Isaiah, having had this vision of God, he responded. God said, who will we send? And Isaiah said, here am I, send me. And what I want us to do now is a big prayer, but I want us to pray that prayer. Yeah. I want us to, in the presence of God, the ultimate monarch, the ultimate ruler, to say, God, here's my life, here am I, use me for your glory. Maybe, maybe you've been in neutral when it comes to God, maybe you used to go for it, maybe you used to serve, maybe you used to tell people about your faith, but maybe you've been in neutral. Come on, now is the time. Yeah. This is a significant moment, not just in history, but for your life. Now is the time, let's get into gear, let's again get going, say, here are my gods, let's go again. Maybe you've been disconnected from church, Maybe you've been on the fringes, but God doesn't want you on the fringes. He wants you right in the centre of his heartbeat, his body, his church, the bride of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ. Come on, it's time to say, here am I, send me. Maybe you've been reluctant and you haven't told anyone your faith. And we saw how the Queen so publicly declared her faith in Jesus to the nation. Maybe it's time for you to start going a bit more public with your faith and say, okay, God, here am I, send me. I'm willing, I'm nervous, but I'm willing here my send me. Maybe you've lost your sense of mission, lost your sense of adventure. God's on the throne. Let's say that together. Here am I, send me. Let's pray that prayer. I'll lead us for a moment and then I'll give you space to pray that prayer. So God now we're going to pray and we're going to dedicate ourselves afresh to serving you with our lives. So Lord God, just like Isaiah said, here am I, send me. We now say that to you. In all the rooms where we are, those who are joining us live, those who are going to watch this over the next few hours or days, we make that decision together. Lord God, we want our lives to count for your glory in our generation. Here is our time. Here is our talent. Here is our treasures. Here is our testimony. Use us for your glory. All right. Every single one of you now. Make your decision. Commit yourself to the purposes of God afresh. Go for it. Make that decision. And maybe for the first time, commit yourself to the purposes of God.
Amen. Amen. God's heard your prayer, folks. It's been good, Pete, to be together. Really good. Um, thank everyone for joining us. Um, take away these thoughts, reflect on them, pray them through. You know, don't, don't say, oh yeah, that was a good moment, but then tomorrow, just go back to normal. Take these thoughts, what God has said to you into your day tomorrow. Live differently, live courageously. Talk about Jesus, share your faith. Yeah, just live it out the way that uh, Queen Elizabeth used to live it out as well. Yeah, and you know, folks, I, I prophetically sense we're in a ta uh, we're in a era change. And sometimes what happens in the natural parallels what's happening in the spiritual realm. When John the Baptist passed away, Jesus saw that as a signal for a change to happen in his operation of ministry. And so I believe we're at an important time. So many significant events have happened on earth. The lockdown, the, the passing of the Queen. And also for City on the Hill, we've had a significant period of huge change, positioning for what God's got for us. And for your own life, God wants to position you for great things that he has planned. We're living in significant times. This is not a time to be on the edges. I encourage you to plug into church. If you're part of another church, that's great. Plug in there. If you're part of City in the Hill, let's plug in together. And by the way, we've got uh, tomorrow morning, yeah. in a few hours time, <laughs> we've got Facebook Live Prayer. So you can join us 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. We'll be back tomorrow morning. And if you missed this, this, this morning's church online experience, we started this series where we're looking at Jesus, and I know it will bless your soul, so please take time to watch back the message from this morning. You can either do that on Facebook or on YouTube. I guess that's that's a fun one. That's us. Yeah. yeah. Over and out. Yeah. Nice Over. to have you with us tonight. Thanks, everyone. God bless, yeah. folks. Bye.